You are listening to episode 138 of the Game Inflators Podcast. Take three. Take three. My name's John, and I'm joined by Joel this week. I make everything better. You do make everything better, Joel. Like mayo. No. So uh, on the Game Inflators Podcast, we like to talk about games we've recently picked up, games we're currently playing, and this week we're talking D&D and Game Addictions. Uh, So Joel is actually filling in for Ryan this week. He did not have an opportunity to record with me, and uh, Joel gracefully decided to uh, jump in. I'm being spackled over. He he really is. All right, so Joel, I kind of gave you the rundown of what we usually do. Uh, We typically talk about our recent pickups and then what we're currently playing, and then we'll dig into our articles or general topic. Uh, This week's topic uh, that I've got is what gaming does to your brain and how that might benefit you. So, for recent pickups, I'll let you go first. If you had anything that you picked up, either gaming, whether that's D and D, magic, video games, picked up. I mean, I got some uh, minis to kill you with later. Um, got uh, my games with gold. Picked up some game called Planet Alpha. Never even tried it. We'll see. And uh, started playing uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider. How's Rise of the Tomb Raider? Is that the? Uh, I think this is the. That's the second installment of the new the modernized. Okay, because I played the first one recently. And we really liked that one. Is the second one pretty good so far? So far, but it's a pain in the ass because I'm playing on an ultra extra fuck you difficulty. So it only saves when you're at a campfire. Oh, seriously? Because so, I know the other one didn't. I think the other one like always saved. Well, so I guess one of the. Um, achievements on one of the uh, updates is you have to play it on what's called extra survivor difficulty. And so, yeah, you have to go to the campfire and save. I found that out the hard way when I died literally right at the end of the first level for whatever reason. I was like, jump forward. And she said, nope, going to the right. And I was like, no. And then you just sat there and you prayed while it was reloading and suddenly the whole level started over again. And yeah, it's you're a good thing. Like, you're like, screw this, throw the controller <laughs> and, and I'm done. It's, it's a good thing that it was the middle of the day and I don't happen to be working right now. So <laughs> you're like, I'm going to make a sandwich and I will come back to you, Laura Croft. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it, although um, the modeling is a little different on her. Um, it, it, she does that weird thing. In some of the cutscenes that uh, Mass Effect Andromeda had, where it was like when they smile, like it just pulls, like they don't move their jaw and their teeth, their jaw just stays in one spot and the skin just pulls back. So when she's talking, there's like just this weirdness to it. Like they spent so much time animating her hair and how it flows on her head and, you know, interacting and not clipping through the different parts of the model that when the smile happens, it's just teeth and then back to it. Or when she's talking, too, it's just teeth. The the jaw's hardly moving in some areas, like no back and forth, uh, no subtle up or down unless the words are actually coming out. But then for whatever reason, like the the mouth stays static. So it's kind of one of those weird things you'd have to see it to know what it is. What are you playing it on? Xbox One. Oh, okay. What, you know, what it was meant to be played on. Yeah. Yeah, because I think... No, I don't think it came out on the PS3 and Xbox 360, that version. I know the, the first, first one, one did. did. The first one was the cross-platform. They actually did it for both. Yeah. Because they knew they were going to release it with both consoles yeah. out. And then the second one was no. I think the third one is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Yeah, and I had initially heard like really poor uh, reviews on that when it first came out, but... I mean, it seems to be holding up okay Metacritic-wise. I think it's in the 70s or 80s. I don't know what the rating is on this one, but I know that the um, the multiplayer component for this one isn't the flat-out like battle multiplayer component like the first one had. This is more of cooperative uh, dungeon crawling and like figuring out puzzles together and junk like that. Yeah, I mean, I like the first one. Uh, Angela and I do plan on playing the second one at some point in time. Uh, we just really haven't gotten to it. Um, so is it safe to say that's what you're currently playing as well then, for the most part? that's kind Yeah, of the what did I, I just finished... Um, 
I just finished being an achievement whore and doing Toy Story 3. You played Toy Story 3. Oh, actually, it was kind of fun. Really? Yeah. There was some platforming bits that were a little repetitive, but the actual story part of the game takes like two and a half, three hours, and that's going around finding collectibles first Mm -hmm. and then playing through the story. Yeah. Um, But the rest of it's like a sandbox run around and just do random stuff. And I would have thought for sure, like, based on, you know, this is a movie tie-in game that probably wasn't developed that well, I'm going to be hitting a lot of glitches. No issues. No no issues with the saves. No issues with... Um, actually, saving was super easy all the time. Um, there's only a few things where... Um, You'd go to like grab things and you'd pick up the wrong thing because it was just too close to something else. But other than that, it was actually pretty entertaining. Although it was, like I said, a lot of collectibles and running around. But for the most part, those collectibles ended up leading to challenges. So I'll give you an example. One of them was, uh, it's called a pictograph or whatever they had. Um, you, you essentially take people and you toss them into buildings and then you dress them in certain ways to recreate certain scenes. And once the last one is dressed the right appropriate way, it marks off that mission and you get a little cutscene. and then you just grab them and like boot them into the building again, start changing mm-hmm. them. But uh, yeah, it wasn't that hard. Wasn't that uh, the most frustrating part was the uh, stunt car part. So you had to like drive a car around which I thought they missed a big opportunity to make it the buggy from Toy Story 1, and they didn't do that. It was just some random toy car. Well, and I mean, and they've had like random toy cars for most part in a lot of those movies. So I think the most, is it Toy Story 4 is the most recent one that came out? Yeah, I didn't see that one. Yeah, that one they have like, it's weird. It's like a raccoon or possum skin car. Like it's some makeshift Oh, in the movie? In the movie, yeah. Oh. So, like, one of the old characters kind of comes back. and Sounds uh, like it was created by Pickle Rick. Kind of, yeah. So, it's like... <laughs> it's like A rat mech suit? <laughs> this one's a possum car? It's like a po- <laughs> I don't think... I don't remember if it's a possum or a raccoon or what it was, but I just know it was like an RC car, and, it, like, the toy controls it from the inside, and it's, like, covered as, like, a possum thing, so, like, it can go and, like, infiltrate, like, playgrounds and crap to rescue other toys. And, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it was, and so everybody's freaking out like possum or whatever. It's just a fucking toy, kind of sitting inside, driving Ooh. another toy. Uh, but yeah, so I guess for me this week, uh, several pickups. So I got Super Street Racing on PS4. Um, it looks like a game that uh, it has poor reviews, but it looks like a title that is probably over time going to likely be more of an uncommon title. Uh, it doesn't seem super popular, so I picked it up. It was like ten dollars at Walmart. Uh, I pre-ordered uh, the Forgotten Realms Magic the Gathering set uh, this week. Ryan also pre-ordered it uh, when I talked to him. Oh, the week. new uh, the new release. Yeah, the dude, cards. oh man, it looks so sick. See, so the sick. only thing I ever got into was the video game one, just because it was really easy, mm-hmm. and I don't have to keep buying packs to find all the cards for it. Yeah, uh, MTGO. So I guess is a new thing right now. Magic the Gathering Online. Uh, I think it's free to play, and you're supposed to be able to build up points and such. Like I think they give you a starter deck, and then you can build up points to actually create uh, more decks and open up like fake packs and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, I went ahead and picked that up. So one of the cards in there that I actually love is called uh, Treasure Chest. I think, mm-hmm. and you straight up roll a d20. And then it has uh, your situations, right? So if you get a one, you lose three life. If you get a, I think it's like a two through nine or four through nine, uh, you get like five tokens. A 10 through 19 gets you uh, something else. And then like a nat 20 gets you something crazy, right? When when do they start putting tokens in? uh, Well, this is a treasure token. So I I haven't experienced treasure tokens yet. I got to read into it before I start playing modern tournaments and such, uh, just in case. But... Uh, yeah, apparently there's like a new thing called treasure tokens, and I need to look into that and see like what it actually is. Yeah, um, the only one I was ever familiar with was the Duel of the Planeswalkers. Yeah, so you have the Planeswalkers get, have their, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, loyalty counters or loyalty points that they have on there that you can boost up every turn or remove. Um, and then token-wise, I mean, you do have tokens that you can bring out, like creature tokens. Uh, and, of course, you've also got... Um, 
They're not tokens. God, I mean, I'm like skipping my mind. I haven't played in so long. Counters. You can put counters on your creatures to boost up like abilities and whatnot. Like so plus one, plus one counters and, and that type of stuff. Because I remember that, that um, what was it? It was the it was the Plains Water combo deck allowed you to do um, a lot of auras in that game. So you could stack auras on your characters, which would then cause... Like depending on this, depending on the oh, yeah, yeah. card, you would end mm-hmm. up getting actually more power than what the aura gave you because the more auras you had, the more powerful the card would become. Yeah, so there's um, I think like Elspeth has a token or an emblem that you can put on the player itself that makes the player more powerful. Uh, there's several of them like that that have like different emblems that they create that are like permanent moving forward in the game. Um, but regardless, I mean, I, I picked up that, uh, we're going to crack open the packs, uh, later in a month when it comes out, put a little blood doping in on your magic, the gathering games, probably yeah, a little blood doping. Uh, <laughs> so let's see what else I got. I pre-ordered the Castlevania collection on limited run games. Uh, I got two copies of that. What's and all that, in the collection? Oh man, it's ridiculous. It's Is got it like, like seven games. It's got like seven or eight games, I think. And it's got a whole bunch of like, it's got a retro Sega type case. Um, has multiple variants of that case. I think it has a soundtrack, some artwork, just a whole bunch of random crap. Because I have, I never had Castlevania for NES, but I had Castlevania for the Game Boy when I was younger, and I never got past the second level because no one ever explained to me, and it didn't, it wasn't in the book either, that this was like a, a go back and like pick up different power ups and then go forward, like find the secret areas to keep moving. Mm-hmm. So that was one one of those ones where I just never got the hang of that one. But then I got like I don't know three or four free ones variations that came out with uh, 360 and Xbox One for like the Gold Pass thing. They were just like, here, here's a Castlevania game. Sweet. Yeah, I think they Add had... Added to the collection. I want to say that they had a collection that was released with several games. A Konami collection, I think? I don't remember. But yeah, it doesn't surprise me that you, got, you were able to get some for free at some point in time. My aunt used to work for uh, North American Distributorship for Konami. So we used to get tons of games all the time. But it was one of those things where she had to pick and choose because her own... She was my great aunt. So her own kids got all the good stuff. And then whenever my grandma would talk to her, she'd be like, oh, his birthday's coming up. Oh, what is he like? Just get him something with Ninja Turtles. He'll be fine. <laughs> so, so that's why I still have somewhere packed away at my parents' house is that Tournament Fighters one. That's the... Oh, on the Nintendo? I think that's still in the top 15 of rare NES cartridges. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one for sure. I know uh, I've got it on the Super Nintendo, but I don't have the NES version. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's see. I think I got a couple other things this week. So I also picked up some more minis. I got some kobolds. I got some, uh, what was the other one I got? Kobolds and, uh, what's the bird one? I keep forgetting. Uh, which ones? The Arakakras or the, uh, Kenku. Kenkus? Kenkus. I got some Kenkus. How many kobolds did you get? Three. Yeah. I'm sitting on like four of them right now. And mm-hmm. then in that, uh, tyranny pack, I just picked up, I ended up with like three three or four Mm -hmm. but i mean kobolds are like rats in the sense that you should be throwing like depending on how sophisticated the traps are you're going to be throwing at your group you should be doing like you know have like 10 kobolds at once it would not be unheard of yeah well we'll see how i how it pans out i haven't decided and i gotta paint them all so not exactly excited about having to paint kobolds because they're so small i would think that like someone needs to come up with some sort of like dip like just some kind of so you're not wasting it but somehow to just when you want to paint like a bunch of little minis at once you just dip them all yeah and i mean just get like the base coat and then maybe like a overall skin tone on it yeah and then just paint over the gear and add your details I'm sure that would save so much time. Oh, it would for sure. Uh, But I got those and then I picked up some Nuln oil and, uh, you know, you got some as well. You've been Uh, playing with that. Uh, You showed it to me and it looks like, I don't know, I'd have to see it like a before and after to get a really good picture of it. Yeah. So I don't have a before and after that and the other mini I'm I'm not going to show you (laughs) that I worked on, but uh, that one came out really good with the Nuln oil. So I had a before and after on that one. And after I hit it with Nuln oil, I was like, wow like that's a world of difference it just 
shows every little detail. Like it just defines it a lot better. And yeah, if you it seems on, like a wash. Yeah. Yeah. And it fills in nicely. So if you were to look at, and I could show you on the, um, uh, in the two that I painted uh, yesterday, if you look at like the brickwork and stuff, uh, it's definitely like filled in completely on the bottom of it. Like you could see like little crevices that are filled in with a darker wash and it just kind of puts a nice glaze over the top. Super solid. Um, but yeah, so I got that. And as far as what I'm playing, I'm playing Biomutant still. Uh, I don't know what to do with this game, man, because it's only like a 10 or 12 hour campaign, but it's taken forever. I'm not enjoying it so much. And I'm not one of those people who just like kind of hate a game and just put it down. Do you have like it on the hardest difficulty? No, I got on like medium. So it's just not that great of a game. It's like a giant ass fetch <laughs> quest. I don't know if you've seen anything of it yet, but you know, you've got like that, uh, like that British narrator. I don't know how many games you played, but it's like, uh, uh, you know, Oh, well this character says this. And like, they go into this whole, like, like it's just them like repeating what is literally on screen. So like, but there's no way to skip it. No, well, no, cause it's dialogue. So like all of the dialogue is like, if you were talking to me and, and you can't just form, mash through it. You can, but it's like, but you have to read it because you got to understand what it is. So you know how in most games, like when you talk to a character in open world RPG, they'll have like their own dialogue or they have like no dialogue, right? Um, and Or they have dialogue, but it's like silent. So this game basically has the character speaking in like an animal language that you have. It's like listening to like Mario. Yeah, code, it, right? it makes, it, you know what? That makes me think of the Toy Story 3. Because yeah. like when you would talk to the little people in the town, yeah. they'd be like... and the words are appearing on the bottom and you're just going oh god because it doesn't let you skip either yeah so So, you have to listen to just so like the the mario games are like tony's like like whatever the hell toad is saying imagine that except somebody literally like reads the words to you afterwards so toad said go fuck yourself that's pretty much exactly how it would be and so that is driving me up a wall like i'm getting kind of used to it uh but for the most part i'm like level 18 or 19 in that game i'm hoping i could just speed through it get it done beat it and just move on to my next thing uh i also played a little apex legends this week for the first time and god knows how long took me about five matches to get my first kill uh which is pretty bad uh, given yeah well i mean it's been like three months since i played like, I haven't played it past the beta, really. I'd never jump back on, but still. It's one of those things, like, it just wasn't, a, I wasn't in that mindset. Or maybe you just, because I remember going on tears and, like, different, um, like, multiplayer shooters where, like, I just would walk in and somehow I'd get sniped. I wouldn't even see who it was. Mm-hmm. Or playing in Halo tournaments back in the day, and you'd have two people on you with pistols. Yeah. So, like, you wouldn't even see them. And one would be aiming at your head, and the other one would just do two shots to the body, and the other one would shoot you in the head. So you, all of a sudden, you, your shield would get hit, and you'd go to react, and you were already dead. Well, and here's the thing: like I was able to get like a, a number of knockdowns for sure, uh, but the issue was is for one thing, I haven't played in a while. Uh, so the speed of a game, I have to kind of get back to that speed of a game. I've been playing RPGs. And the other thing is Justin likes to drop us in hot zones all the damn time. So no matter, like, I totally am. Like, I'm like, do not drop me in a hot zone right now. Because okay, you're dropping you in a hot zone. Yeah, Got he, it. He's like, let's drop in a hot zone. So like every single time, like I'm trying to get back to the speed of a game. And he's like, hot zone. So I don't even have a moment to like sit back Did, and like practice. So what was taking you out? The people when they were down on the ground still? Or the people that like teammates would come in and take you out? That's usually what it was. So like one guy, for example, like I beat him to both the guns and I was taking him out and his team teammate came behind me and took me out from behind when I had no shield. So like I took the the two guns that were in that area was taking the guy out. And of course I had Valkyrie from like Titanfall. So of course he's like, shoo, like flies across. So I'm like, okay, great. Like haven't played against Valkyrie yet. So I'm not used to the aspect of trying to shoot a character and movement right now. Um, so got that guy down pretty low, but my two teammates, Justin being one of them decided to drop somewhere else instead of next to me where I had pinned where I was going to drop and, of course, the other guy's teammate took me out. If they would have dropped with me, we would have taken out the whole squad right off the bat. Because, I mean, I had the guy. Like, it was pretty much done. And so Justin's like, oh, you didn't do any damage to that guy. I'm like, yeah, because you didn't drop with me. And his buddy killed me from behind. And that's who just killed you. The guy that you tried to kill right after me. He's like, well, you didn't do any damage. I'm like, no, because I was trying to kill the other guy. So that, that was a whole mess. But we finally, we and what's crazy is we kept placing, like, within, like, the top five every round it's not like i wasn't doing damage i was doing like four and five but you didn't get damage. anyone down i just wasn't getting any crazy kills like 
everybody else is coming and taking them. I did have a no scope uh, snipe, <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, now was that planned or was that like, oh shit? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was uh, not exactly planned, but it was more so I didn't have any guns outside of like uh, the Mozambique. And so I just kind of came up with the, uh, I forget which sniper it was. And just, there's this guy like tailing Justin. So I'm watching him and Justin's going like around. He's basically chasing Justin. Justin goes this way. The guy goes the other way. And I no scoped right when he was coming to face me and he got knocked down. And Justin's like, oh, oh, thank God. <laughs> like, like it was the most hilarious thing because Justin had like no health. And so the guy's like tailing him around and like they're literally going in circles around a giant like set of boxes. It's the funniest thing. So I'm just watching it from the side and like, all right, lined up. It was good. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. I like those double headshots or more with the scope though, with sniper rifles. That was always fun too to get them accidentally like back in the days playing Modern Warfare 2. Or Halo. Halo no scopes are always fun. Oh, well, scoping in Halo when you could bounce the sniper shot, Mm -hmm. that was always ridiculous. Like someone would be inside like a... There are times on like old uh, Blood Gulch, if you hit like certain cavern edges right, it would bounce. So you could shoot the edge of the cavern and it would just fly down the center of the cavern. And if someone was shooting you and then backed up into the cavern, you had a sniper rifle. I mean, it didn't happen often, but you could shoot the edge of that cavern and all of a sudden kill them. (laughs) All I remember uh, is sticky grenades for the most part and super jumps uh, and trying to snipe people with super jumps from the top of a level. That was always fun. Uh, There was people who would glitch up to the tops of the maps and you'd be like, where am I getting sniped from? And it was... That was me. That was usually me. Yeah. So once you finally got up there, it was just a lot of fun to like hit somebody with a sniper from the very top. Uh, My friend Matt and I used to uh, enrage everyone because this is back in the day before Xbox Live. So we would have, um, in our dorms at college, we would do router groups. So we would have That's four boxes. That's what we used to do, too. Yeah. And we'd have 16 players, so eight on eight. And we would get, um, we would not be getting any kills, and our teams would be so frustrated with us. Because all we would do is we'd go over, we'd steal their tank, steal their Warthog, and then bring it over to our base. And then we would get our, we would get one of the tanks on top of our base and put it inside. Yeah. <laughs> So then you couldn't pick up our flag. Yeah. But you could, if you tried to grab the flag, you would just get into the tank and be stuck in the base. <laughs> and then you would just get out of the tank and then get in the tank. So you could go grab their flag, run back, drop it, and it would count. Nice. And so <laughs> there, was, there was times where we'd be like, you know, so many captures behind. And then we'd finally get the tank up there. And that would be, that would be game because then we'd just run over and <laughs> get their flag and come back. And they couldn't get ours anymore. So, yeah, we became hated on our, <laughs> in our dorm. Yeah. Like, you know, don't let them play together. All they do is put the scorpion in the base. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome stuff, dude. Oh, man, I hadn't tried that one, but now I got to look into it. Um, well, Let's uh, let's kind of dig into our overall topics. So I figured we could talk some D&D. Uh, so for anybody that doesn't know, and you all don't know because Joel's never been on here before, uh, Joel's actually our DM for the campaign in which I had um, Hemo, the drunken master, and then now I run with uh, Sonia, who I've talked about before, who's that little uh, dwarf barbarian with a giant-ass hammer. Uh, so Joel runs that campaign. We play that one on Sundays, and we play mine on Saturdays. Uh, so we're not going to talk too much about mine, but... Um, you know, since we talked about it before, I uh, figured, uh, since I always give random updates, maybe talking to you a little bit about our campaign that we're running on Sundays, your overall thoughts, and uh, really, I guess what I'm looking at here is just a little bit about your planning process. What's your favorite part about planning for us? Obviously, it's the part where you want to kill us. Uh, yeah, that's always a goal. How do you think the campaign is going so far, and what is your favorite moment up to this point been? All right, you're going to have to go over those again. Okay, one yeah, by yeah, one. for sure. So let's start with the first one, which is going to be uh, your planning process and your favorite part of the planning. Okay, so I've already basically detailed the overall arc of the story. Like, I mean, we've been playing almost two years now. Um, you know, pro- more than two years, but let's not count those weeks that we've taken plenty of time off or, you know, there's game, times where you haven't played in like a month or yeah, a month we just, and a half. We just had one of those situations where we didn't play for like three weeks. Yeah. Cause you moved and then I went on vacation and there was a whole bunch of stuff in there. But, um, <clears throat> I have the overall story arced out. Um, certain things kind of fall in my lap and then I'll plan around those too, which are, that's super fun. 
So for, for example, um, when you guys met the uh, dwarf uh, Tenebrin Stone Shaft and those other dwarves that um, were down near the Mirror of Dead Men, and he was all acid scarred because of fighting a black dragon that he hates that lives in the swamp. Um, and that she has her own brood and he had his black dragon scale armor from killing her children and making armor out of her kids. Yeah. Like, and the reason he hunted her down with such prejudice and malice is because she wiped out an entire battalion that he was a part of other than him. And that's why he didn't have a beard. That's why he talked like this. Cause his vocal cords were all burnt to shit and everything. So, um, when you guys, that was already set. Like that was some kind of, I was like, they need to encounter somebody. I'll build this in. And I was just going to have that looming threat of a black dragon in the swamp. If you guys ever headed that way or really went that way. And there was actually a chance to encounter her. Um, when you guys went through to the shadow fell through that portal. Yeah. There was a chance to encounter her at any point in the swamp, depending on which way you guys went. Um, if you did not follow, follow the shadow Kai. So that group that kind of led you to the portal, if you had just been like, screw you guys and went off. Well, no, there was a chance I was going to roll for it, but there was a chance that you were going to encounter the dragon because you didn't have an idea which way to go. You were just following the dead that were coming through the swamp. So, I mean, you could have went in any particular direction, but because if you had fought with that group of Shadar Kai, then they may not have outright killed you because that wasn't what their mission was but they would have left you wounded and not helped you. And in which case, then you would have been on your own and you might've encountered the dragon. So that was already pre-planned. But the fact of when you guys were using that bag that I gave you, and I wasn't even looking at it. Like I was like, oh, there's a lot of cool stuff in here. When you rolled, so it's a D100 bag. There's a hundred different random items that can be pulled from this bag once a day. So once a day you pull, and you can get the same item again. The, the item is tied to the bag. Um, you pulled that black sapphire. I was like, oh, man, the black sapphire. Where would that have come from? Like, I started thinking about it. And a, it said on the list it was like a, a scratched up black sapphire worth about 50 gold. I was like, huh. I was like, you know who would really like a black sapphire? A black dragon. Oh, maybe this will give them a reason, like, they'll be hunted by the dragon. And then you guys sold that thing. (laughs) And I was like, huh, (laughs) I think someone's going to be pissed and want her sapphire back. And so that that just neatly fell into place. But the overall arc of what you guys are going through and what you still don't have the full picture, although you kind of have an idea of what's happening with the planes breaking down and things bleeding into one another... Um, that's the overall arc of the story, but, um, there's a lot of little side stuff there. Like for example, uh, Ginny's character, Juniper, um, she's here in the house. No, she's outside. I can hear her outside. Okay, good, good, good. So three times she has had the opportunity to encounter her estranged brother. And each time she has rolled dog shit on perception i mean less than a four (laughs) every (laughs) single time and i'm like okay so i just i move on and when she finally does uh, encounter him she can be like oh my god yeah and i and i've come across that too like i've gotten a hint when you're telling her to roll i'm like shit there's a family member that she's gonna meet because like there's been a number of times that you've hinted towards a family member for her and so you know and obviously now dming and such like i I've been able to kind of pick a lot of that stuff out as you're kind of, you know, coming to it. And yeah, there's been a couple occasions where I've noted, Hmm. Yep. Something's about to happen. And then she's like two. I'm like, Nope, it's not going to (laughs) happen. No. And it's not like I'm making the DC all that hard either, but it's not going to be a gimme because she's, it's not something she's looking out for. You're you're looking at like a 12 or 15 roughly. Less. Really? Even like like a a 10? Like by the, by the third time, I put so many things in there that would key her in that the DC was like an eight that I had set. 
Yeah. And so I was like, okay, an eight's fine. And then she rolled like a four. <laughs> or no, she rolled like a six or something because it was like she's got a uh, static yeah. plus four. Yeah. So that was just one of those weird like, oh, well. And it's very difficult sometimes to be like, oh, I set this up. But I can't reward that. I can't yeah. just continue on. Like the only time you kind of cheat that or maybe allow another character to roll is if it's... If it has to happen. Or it's a key part of the story, in which case then you don't want to cheat that often. And you don't want to do it regularly unless somebody's already kind of rolled. Um, You you just want to give that to the players. You just want to say, okay, while you are searching, like, so you kill some dragon and you're going through the horde. If there is like a, a quest item or key item there, you guys are going to find it. The role for your investigation isn't to not find it. The role is to see what additional treasures or bonuses that maybe you pick up while you're there. But everything else is just icing on the cake. That's You're there for that quest item or that MacGuffin, whatever it may be. Yeah, and I've had to do that a few times in even our campaign where it's just like critical components to the story. It's like an intelligence check is going to get you like required information. And I'm like, yeah, roll for intelligence. And you guys are like, a six. And I'm like... Uh, yeah, you get like X information. Like I give enough to be able to progress. It might not be a ton, but enough to be able to progress and at least give you the idea of like, okay, this is the direction we need to go. Well, yeah. But in in some cases when you're planning that out, um, if it's that kind of a component, it's sometimes it's better just not to have it rolled for, just give it to the players. Yeah. Or just say one in particular. Like, for instance, the whatever character, because of your experience with uh, nature, which I always found really weird because you could have a dumb as shit druid who rolls dog shit on nature because it's an intelligence stat. And it's like, but they're super wise and they know a ton about nature because they live in nature. So why wouldn't they have that bonus? Yeah. You so give like, them the advantage roll in those cases. Yeah. It, it's it's really weird like how sometimes those are set up. Um, although, like... I do like, um, I saw a guy on YouTube once talk about how we should go back to the way like uh, d and I think it was 3.5 and 3 was set up where your intelligence modifier gave you extra proficiency in skills. So that way that balances out and actually encourages people to take a high intelligence um, to get those bonuses or skill proficiencies because... Why wouldn't they have them? Yeah, there are certain instances where it's like, roll for this, and it's labeled as intelligence, and it's just like, man, that sucks. Like, just because it's an intelligence roll, it's going to be, I think for me, it's a zero for, for my plus, right? So I'm not getting unless I'm proficient, which is part of what I do when, when creating my characters is make sure that I put my proficiency bonuses on areas where I'm actually weak sometimes. Uh, and areas I know I'm going to have to roll on. It's so like a history. I don't know if I have history for my character because I've got, no, you as got a that. dwarf, I've got the stone thing. So, so you, get you get, um, you don't get advantage, actually. It's a, not advantage, you, you but you double your proficiency bonus. Yeah, on that one. But like I try to add a proficiency bonus to areas that I know I'm going to be weak in for the most part. Like a religion might be something you'd want to if you're not kind of strong in that area. It depends on the campaign, depends on what you're looking to accomplish. But Oftentimes, I try to put a proficiency towards something random like that. To kind well, of so out. there's the idea of like, say, having like a buff wizard. Yeah. Like, okay, well, what if like, and I saw this in another video. I wish I could give credit to the person I saw who had it. But the, the idea is like, okay, well, let's say this wizard, when they were growing up and trying to study books and read, they would climb up into trees all the time. Mm-hmm. So maybe why wouldn't they, even though they have a high intelligence, why wouldn't they also have proficiency in athletics? Because yeah. they were climbing trees as a kid and well into their teens and young adult age, like that's where they like to read. Why wouldn't they have that proficiency to climb, especially, you know, in a tree Yeah, or whatever, maybe special proficiencies and circumstances that may arise. Maybe they're not good at climbing mountains, but, you know, in a group you know, wants to climb a tree to see where they are. Yeah. The wizard actually is the one who just scuttles up the tree and takes a look for everyone. Mm-hmm. So um, I guess kind of back to your planning process here in, and what we're doing, do you already have like the end of our campaign figured out like how it's going to end? Yes and, and no. Okay. So what I have is uh, main story beats. Yeah. So I have, okay, they're going to go here right now. You guys are actually, you have the leisure to go, 
either to Waterdeep or go north to the airplane, I believe. Yeah, so like you can go towards Water, yeah, Waterdeep or I think it's Luskin. Yeah. And obviously you guys are on the wanting to check on um, Angela's uh, giraffe that got lost at the top of the mountain. That was funny. Um, which I did Angel. not plan, but was wonderfully one of those things that was just like, here's how it would happen. Uh-huh. So um, I don't know if you talked about it, but um, I have not talked about the giraffe situation, uh, but we did play in the arms of an angel after. <laughs> so um, Angela has a pet giraffe that she rides around on. And because he's weak as shit, he is in a iron flask um, to protect him while they're on the plane of fire. Um, the way an iron flask works, though, is if the creature is ever on its home plane, the flask doesn't work. So the creature comes out of it. So uh, Angela's character got banished during one of the battles and she was there for more than a turn. So at the top of her next turn, her giraffe pops out of the flask. And I even tried to give her like a dexterity to try to kind of, I don't know, somehow pull him back into the flask before she disappeared back, but it didn't work. So he is somewhere trapped. What could have been much worse the was ocean. I rolled to see where they would end up, and yeah, the ocean was on the table. Like there would be no chance of ever rescuing him no. if he disappeared in the ocean. Straight up drowned right off the bat. Yeah, within a few rounds. Yeah. Unlike, well, depending on how you did it, right? Because yeah, a few rounds. It could have been something along the lines. If you wanted to rescue the giraffe, it could have been like a fisherman picked it up or something along the lines or some sort of... Had to be super lucky. Yeah. No, I know. I know. But I'm just saying like you as a DM would have that leisure to say, you know what? I don't want to kill this character yet. Here's how I'm going to go ahead and do this. And here's how I can tie it in to say... Well, that's the thing. I've never... Other than your not rules as written, I've given you all... All your characters have one freebie um, for death. And then that's it. Yeah. So there's no more. I mean, Angela's burned. Everyone's burned through theirs at this point. So everyone's required to have some kind of. Well, I don't think I. Tec- I think technically yeah, you did. You used it up when you were getting tested. You were like, I can't die, and then they killed you. No, but they didn't. Oh, did they? No, they, no. I thought they knocked me out. <laughs> no, they. Killed oh, they you. straight up killed me. That's they right. They straight right. up killed you. That's right. And then and you then were they like were all pissed off. And like, then you came back, and I was like, "That's your freebie." <laughs> That's all right. I, I remember that. I had my technical freebie from the lightning strike on my character to kill her. And then brought her back, and then that would have been like a secondary, like new freebie. Well, yeah. that that's part of your backstory. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't matter in that regard. So um, yeah. yeah, and I mean, after and there's a few things that like I didn't plan, but due to actions, um, I love how I trolled Hemo so hard with um, Fantana stealing his flask. I had well, here's the thing that I had to do that with that character. I didn't, you didn't have, have to destroy the bar. I didn't have to destroy bar. However, going after her, I fully understand. He is an alcoholic and it was more so trying to unload everything he can in pure frustration of just being like bam, earth elements will go kill her type of thing. And so yeah, while the bar didn't necessarily have to be destroyed at that point, in my mind it was like this character is already all like far too gone at this point. So let's just blow this shit up. Like was what just... was glorious was like I had literally put, uh, I rolled yeah. and she literally put the flask back in the same pocket she took it from Yeah, when you guys encountered each other. So, um, well, and then you had charmed him, uh, charmed him as well. But the thing that I forgot was that at, at that level as a monk, an I just had to, I could have discharged it right away and just beat her up. So that's something I didn't do, and I completely forgot my character had it. For one thing, it was a new ability I had. I'd mm-hmm. only had it for a short period of time. So, it, and in fact, I hadn't really had the Well, it works it. out in the story. It doesn't seem like your character would have been of the mind to even think about exactly. doing something like this because you're so upset yeah. your flask was stolen. Yeah. So That was funny. Yeah. And then we had court. That was also good. What's that? We had the, the court situation as well. Oh, yeah. The yeah, trial. Yeah. yeah, that was good stuff. So, yeah. So, um I don't know if John's talked about it, but his character, Hemo, the drunken master, um, I had a bard slip his flask out of his pocket when he wasn't looking. Um, Actually, off the bar, he was using it to pour people's drinks. Um, Needy people, I might add. 
Yes, because the needy need alcohol. Hey, their whole town had been like demolished by this like crazy situation. Uh, a lot of places, but not the whole town. Well, they needed alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> so they needed to cope somehow. I stole it from him for for the day, and he lost his shit. Tried to run through people's rooms that night in the inn. That was good. Trying to break into rooms, and finally he just broke into one too many and got kicked out. Also got slapped around by his own. Uh, kind of mentor who was staying in one of the rooms. That was funny. <laughs> um, and then the next day, accosted the person who had stole it without any proof, though. Yeah. And during that, I rolled again for sleight of hand to put it back in your pocket, which easily succeeded. And um, to his defense, though, that sleight of hand on a bard was like stupid high. So she has expertise and she has gloves of thievery. Yeah, and like she has like what a plus ten or some shit. Like I think it's a, it's ridiculous. Okay, it's so stupid. she's got like, plus there's five no way decks. To, there's no way to beat plus, this thing. It's her. So it's plus. It's like a plus sixteen. Yeah, it's stupid. Like there's no way for me to beat that. And my my character's uh, perception was not the highest either. So that just didn't help. No. Um. But yeah. So that that was an interesting situation in general. But you know. Something I'd like to do with that and as a player is, you know, now that I've got a, he technically isn't dead, he's in jail or whatever the situation is, and we still gotta figure out that whole like Yeah, that's what's a going separate on. session, what's happening. Yeah, so but I mean that gives me the ability down the road because now my dwarf is pregnant. So that was interesting. Or well, potentially pregnant. We'll see. We'll see. We'll it's, see. You are constantly in battle, you're not quite sure yet, and um there's always a chance during combat something bad happens. Yeah, that's true. Oh my god, really? You're gonna have me have a have a miscarriage in the middle of the battlefield? I would say that considering that you're constantly raging and getting beat up on to within an inch of your life. Yeah, yeah, that would that there's a chance that might happen. That'd be pretty crazy, actually. Plus, your character has no idea whether you're pregnant or well, not. Well, and here's the thing: it depends too, right? So if my character finds out they're pregnant, they may stop jumping in the battle as hardcore as they were before so that's something i might have to consider as my character being a lawful good character might say you know i i can't you know continue doing what i'm doing i'm gonna lose this baby whatever the case may be so my character may take a turn in regard to that which to the dismay of the rest of the party however that could be a perfect entry point for a redemption arc from one hemo who may not know who may not be a drunken master and I think I brought to you before, um, I think there's a type of monk that's able to control the elements. Yeah. So going all Avatar. I think they have to choose, though. So like at each level, they have to pick whether they're going to take an earth, a water, a wind, or a fire ability. Yeah, so that might be something to look into because of the nature of where he's imprisoned and the people that are in that town. That, you know, I forget the Harpers, right? So there is like that magical type of component tied to that city. So, I well, don't know. It's something to consider. There's uh, there's a lot to consider. So, it, like, going... I mean, we keep straying away, but coming back to it, the overall arc of the campaign is already planned out. Now, I have certain events. I even have that calendar. So, certain things are going to happen on certain days, whether you guys are prepared or not. Um, and so, uh, if it reaches that day, that thing will happen. If you guys somehow close all the loops and time frame, like you stop whatever you're working on, then you actually have some sort of downtime that you could then or turn into uh, going after clues for other things that are already there. And then there's a little few side quests here and there that you guys have jumped on and picked up and that's killed some of the time working on the main quest line. But I mean, I'm not upset about it. Um, working your guys' stories into everything has been a bit of a challenge considering like I first created the story with seven players in mind yeah the, you know we started this with seven players for the first session and everything was i had probably 20 hours of planning as far as structuring the story and tying people's um backstories together or having them connect in certain ways down the road like oh this will happen here or this can happen in certain ways and then that the, that group got blown up and so I was left with three players and then it was like a triage thing like okay how can I keep these three players still on this uh, can't going through this campaign that I have 
created. So how do you think the campaign is going overall, like at this point, given that we have three players and is it kind of map shaping out the way that you want it to with just three of us compared to when we had seven? Uh, it's moving slower, but that also be is because I'm forced to try to balance things for three players when I had already kind of balanced most of my main encounters for um, like around six or seven because there's a few big encounters I had already planned out. Um, but it's not that hard to rebalance. The, the campaign itself is... I think it's on the right track. I mean, as long as you guys are enjoying it and having fun, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So, I mean, there's good things about it. There's Sometimes there's bad things, and I've learned a lot, like taking over and, you know, DMing for two years, you know, from the seat of my pants in, on something that I'm not following a campaign guide. So creating a game from the ground up is a challenge, especially finding little rewarding moments not just for the characters, but for the players. Like, for instance, um, I know you are more interested in getting big kills for your character and picking up awesome loot. Yeah. So that is that is something that, I mean, while you're cool with stuff happening as far as a backstory is concerned, you're more interested in the loot and the big kills. Um, whereas, like, Virginia wants to have you know, more story tie in and her magical items don't mean much to her, you know, and what, you know, the fight doesn't mean much. She wants more of a story. She wants more of a backstory. And I think Angela's kind of middle of the road, but she definitely wants to have some kind of tie or if she can find something or sacrifice something in order to buff up Sunny, she would. Um, so like the playing, trying to bring in characters because Angela already had her big character arc, like a little bit of it, you know, like we got that um, going back and seeing her parents and having that whole thing where she rescues yeah. them. Um, and there was a chance that you guys could have saved them early. Mm -hmm. Like if you had actually rushed back from the wall, you would have actually seen them being taken rather than stumble upon the house after they were already taken. And um, depending on how fast you got down into the tunnel before they were kidnapped, you could have uh, saved them based on the time frame. Yeah. So uh, every round, another sack was taken down, and that contained however many people in it. So when they were being kidnapped, so the, I mean, you, there was a chance you could have grabbed them before they went down too. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what has been your favorite moment up to this point with the campaign? kind of hard to say i mean i got a lot of favorite moments i certainly enjoy fucking with you very very much um in the game by the way in the game and both so <laughs> <laughs> um just just messing around with different people uh throwing the surprises and the curveballs their way um i think it's more like um i have like little pleasures too in the game that you guys don't get. Uh, you like, mentioned like some Latin and stuff, and you've thrown in like some keywords that we just yeah. Like I will actually take up. the time, and it doesn't take too long. But like, um, like for instance, um, I forget off the top of my head, but one of the Afrit you guys or the Afriti that you guys countered the captain is uh, his name in Arabic is loyal one. So I literally, because that's all geared around like Middle Eastern, like the, the, uh, Jinn and the Ifridi and, um, all of those elemental creatures and from those planes are geared around a Middle Eastern kind of, um, lore. I started giving them names in Arabic and just, you know, doing a Google translate with it. I'm sure it's not exactly correct, but that's still just my own little, Ha, I'm putting this in there. Um, you know, the the reveal of um, the black dragon and the sapphire and that you guys had caused the attack on Neverwinter when she went to and the, the damage to, you know, an NPC friend and all of that stuff. That was wonderfully, mm -hmm. like, I loved watching that, like that realization of like, oh, we fucked up. 
Oh, I was just like, that was cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, my character had no sort of. Uh, no, she did have. No, she didn't have any sort of. No, tie you're on that. you're at that point because Hemo had been taken. Yeah, and Hemo's the one that had experienced the selling aspect of that sapphire. So for Sonia, it was more or less like, oh, you guys messed up. <laughs> So, you know, little surprises, little seeds that I plant and then, like, get to harvest later are some of my favorite parts. Um, I mean, I still have plenty of those going right now, so I can't, you know, reveal all of them. But yeah. um, that, it's like, it's, I talked to my friend the other day about this. And it's like, when you're DMing, if you, the joy you get, the fun you get to have is watching your players like kids on Christmas open their gifts and them not knowing what they're going to get and going, oh, yeah. And sometimes it's just what they wanted. And other times it's like, oh, socks again. <laughs> Fuck you. You get socks. Oh, that reminds <laughs> me. That time that you had dropped some like some claw, like adamantine claws or something. Oh, uh, I purposely put something yeah. in there because I knew your character would just go, give me mine. Yeah, exactly. Well, so. not your character so much, but you, John. Me personally, yeah. So this asshole cursed some fucking claws. So I'm like, yo, cool, like these claws. And then, yeah, he's like, well, He goes so to take them off and he you can't. You No, it's not that you, you don't want to. Yeah. That's right, yeah. <laughs> these you are great. I'm going to keep these on. <laughs> yeah, I love these. These are awesome. Like, I should just have these forever. I'm like, God damn it. I'm, I'm like, never going to not use these now. Curse the damn thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Then at that point, I had to be like, let's metagame this and act funny for the other characters. Be like, what's going on? So, yeah. Uh, but I... Yeah, I've had a lot of favorite moments as well, but I think the campaign's going great so far, and uh, hopefully not two more years. <laughs> we'll see. Well, well, we're you guys are things we're are actually picking faster. up faster and faster. Yeah. Um, well, I think it, a part of it is like it's yeah, it's been two years, but like we've had to, in a sense, have a learning curve uh, in a way of like you know, just kind of picking up for a campaign that was meant to be for seven people. Right. So I figured you guys would have made it through most of these challenges yeah. much quicker. Um, and also, like, as I flesh things out, so I have the ma main overall story. And then, like, when you guys go into doing, okay, what are some of the encounters, what are some of the challenges I'm going to give them on their way? And then I start to flesh those out. So, like, for instance, I knew I wanted a big battle between the Phoenix and the Zeratan that you guys could actually choose sides for while you were straddling that plane of fire, plane of earth kind of area. And then you could have worked it out. Um, the uh, idea of the Grand Vizier being that wizard you guys fucked over in the plane of earth that was a spur of the moment, like the week before I was like, oh my God, it would be totally cool if it was him. And then once I had done that, I was like, oh, so what are the consequences now? Like, I didn't think of the consequences before I put that in. And I was like, okay, so uh, now I'm going to have to either have them get out of it or try to see if my NPC can talk them out of it. And it's, it's always difficult having that DMPC in there because... I, and I hope I'm playing it right. I ask Virginia a lot. I don't want to take the story away from you guys, which is why most of the time my DMPCs are just there to fill whatever hole you may have as far as your group uh, content may go. Yeah. So like, you know, throwing in a cleric that heals a little bit better or throwing in a, a wizard or throwing in a bard or someone who can be more of a support character and fill that role rather than, you know, I mean, I'm chances are you're not going to get a druid or a monk or, you know, a, another barbarian because the idea is that character that I'm going to be playing or throwing in as, as your fourth for this leg of the adventure is going to be serving some other role. And being able to stay in the background while occasionally when you guys ask, be able to offer some information occasionally. But... I mean, I don't have them be, like, the key character for everything. Um, Which I've noticed that you've done, obviously, if you're out the campaign. The only one who tends out. to know a little bit more is Brother Brayson, but that's also because he's kind of of the order where everything's kind of coming from. So he has that idea of, oh, this, is, this may be what's happening, but he's also so... Um, not playing it close to the vest, but he's so... Um, uh, I guess invested in making sure that the information he gives you is correct 
that he makes he he needs his proof before he's convinced. He has his suspicions, but he doesn't really act on them or even s- spread those suspicions until he he proves them correct himself. Yeah. Well, so I guess let's let's kind of move into our next topic here uh, that we'll chat about. And uh, you know, obviously we we do a lot of D and D. You and I do a lot of planning around it, um, a lot of painting. So in a sense, you know, we're consumed by D and D a lot. And the next article here, the article that I pulled for this week was what gaming does to your brain and how you might benefit. And this is more on video games, obviously. Uh, so this is Tom James Carter of Wired. And so the article here really talks about, um, you know, a couple different takes, right? One is gaming as an addiction and how, uh, like anything else, pre- you know, pleasurable in life, it goes on, you know, like like sex or uh, food or whatever it may be, right? You get pleasure, you have the, was it, the dopamine, dopamine and all that. Yeah, so all of it kind of kicks in and uh, becomes addicting, right? Well, um, it's that reward over and yeah. over again. So that idea that, um, you know, you did something, yay me, I get a dopamine hit. Yeah. And that's just your brain treating you to, here you go, you did something good, buddy. Here's yeah. a treat. Exactly. So it, it goes into that. It even it has an article in here, or an article, uh, it has a story uh, that talks about a girl, a little young girl who would actually keep wetting herself so she could keep playing video games. Like that's, she was so addicted to gaming that she kept peeing herself so she could get back to playing so she gets to keep herself up, so essentially. The- so, oh, while she was supposed to be going to sleep, yeah, she would wet herself, yeah. which would keep her awake. So she could play games. Oh, so interesting. That was an interesting one. Well, uh, number one, how old was the child? I, I didn't even get that deep into it. It was more so a reference to a prior child. I think it was Fortnite is what they were playing. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, the article goes to talk about how there are some perceived benefits that can help with brain functionality, such as, you know, multitasking, uh, quick thinking, et cetera. And, uh, you know, just kind of wondering, you know, I've got my thoughts on this topic overall, but like, what are your general thoughts on gaming addiction and I guess really the pros and cons? Well, it depends. Um, if somebody's addicted to a game, they will be exceptionally good at those things that the game requires, but not necessarily good at anything else because they've grown their addiction towards that. Like, you know, someone who takes heroin every day, they're going to take smack like a champ, but you give them meth and they're going to lose their goddamn minds. So the same thing with anybody who's taking, you know, video games. Somebody who's a Fortnite master, you hand them a different game uh, that's not the same genre and they may break down or it's boring or they're not getting their dopamine hit. So... It's not that they're addicted to gaming per se. It's they're addicted to a particular game. And that seems to be, when everyone talks about gaming addiction, it's not an addiction to gaming. It's an addiction to a particular game that just happens to light up those neural pathways and give them that dopamine hit over and over again. Like people getting addicted to World of Warcraft or any other MMO RPGs. Or you mean Warcrack, can, right? Yeah, Warcrack. Yeah, exactly. And in... For me, personally, um, I get addicted in the sense that to complete the game. Once I've completed the game, it's like I'll, I'll put like one or two, maybe sometimes three games on a rotation. And my goal is to either get all the achievements or complete the game. Once I've done that, I take a break. I don't play a different, I'll play a different game or I'll rotate in something else now once I've gotten those done. So I guess that's my addiction is the little pops of the achievements. But at the same time, like, yeah, I can go without doing it for a while. Like for the other day, um, I went on vacation for nearly a week and didn't play games at all. And I wasn't like, oh, my God, I got to get that achievement pop. So I don't see that, you know, maybe... Uh, what would you call it a niche while you're playing the game like it's not really an addiction but it's like that's your pleasure zone while you're playing like maybe you're addicted to story it's got to be a good story or maybe you're addicted to the pops of the achievements or maybe you're addicted to you know hearing somebody scream at you and cuss at you in multiplayer chat because you just killed them for the 13th time you know whatever that may be that's where you're deriving that pleasure sense from but I mean, I think it's anybody who gets addicted to anything. The only reason you're addicted to that thing is because that thing got there first. Yeah. 
you have an addictive personality or you have a specific pathway of addiction that is built in and you just found the thing that found that pathway. You probably would have been addicted to something else had that got there before this thing did. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, I, I kind of look at it the same respect. I'm like, I love gaming, right? I think I'm more addicted to the collecting aspect and the hunt and thrill of finding new games than I am gaming itself, to be honest. But you have too many. There's <laughs> no way you could play them all. There is no way I could play them all. However, there are other people that like to play those games. So I do loan out games to people every now and then. My wife plays games. I play games. Uh, whenever family members come into town, I've had people stay with me for an extended period of time. And at night, after I go to bed, they play games and they just kind of chill back. Like we had um, a friend's son actually came in last summer to visit me. And at night, he was playing uh, Dirge of Cerberus, the PS2 game. Or, yeah, the PS2 game for Final Fantasy. He had never played it before. And so after I'd be like, hey, I'm going to bed, or he's like, okay, I'm going to play this game. Kid beat the game in a week and a half. He was here with me, you know, yep. so I might not have played that, but he didn't have it and he got to enjoy it. And then I had like some duplicates of certain games, like some, you know, lower end titles. I'm like, here, take some games. Like I literally had stuff that I had just picked up and it was just, I don't do in. my own heroin. I just <laughs> let others take it. <laughs> <Exactly. funny. laughs> so, I loan it out. <laughs> <laughs> I loan out my heroin. Uh, First yes. one's free child. <laughs> The free instead of free candy van, free video game van. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, the gaming itself, like I'm with you on that. I don't it's, think you even need to kidnap them. You just drive slowly and they'd walk behind, continuing to play. And you take right. them where you want. It. You'd throw have the a Pied Piper. Throw a Game Boy on a, on a <laughs> Pied <string>. Piper van. <laughs> just video games. Oh, God. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, I can see it with the whole like one particular game. So Apex Legends is like that for me. There's time, like before, I was just constantly playing Apex Legends. However, um, I, I would say that an addiction is more so on the fact that you are unwilling to do anything else other than that one activity, or it's such a an, such a big thing in your life, and you get such a dopamine hit from it, you always have to do it. Well, yeah, like that's those point. those parents who, um, uh, you you got so addicted to World of Warcraft that their baby starved to death. Yeah, like the baby was crying, yeah. so they just like put towels under the door to help muffle the cries while they got back to raiding. Wow, like. Okay, you you're you're broken. Yeah, you're to the point where, yeah, you if that is your one leisure activity, if it's like I do this, you know, I go to work, I take care of my family, and when I get one hour or two hours to myself, I sit down and I play one video game. Mm -hmm. I don't see that being an addiction. Same here, and that's honestly that's my life, right? So I I work for a period of time, and then I hang out with my wife for a little bit. We'll watch TV, whatever it may be. She goes to bed. I play video games for a few hours, but I'm not always playing video games. So for example, this week I was painting miniatures. Uh, today I was cleaning the house. I had six hours. I could have been doing whatever I wanted because she was at work. Instead, I decided to fumigate outside of my property, decided to pick up around my house and clean and get stuff ready for dinner. So, I mean, like that in itself, you know, I love video games. I love playing them. But at the same time, and I think part of that's part of growing up, right? That the older you get, the more you recognize there are other things that you need to maintain before you can get that, like that dopamine hit, right? Do well, I that's, that's the ability to delay gratification. Yeah. And exactly. no, some people either lose that or they don't have it. Like, or they never develop it as a child. That's like that kid who gets spoiled and, oh, I want ice cream. Well, you got to eat dinner, but I want ice cream. All right, give them the ice cream. Yeah. Like that, that somebody doesn't learn how to delay gratification and then they turn into somebody who may or may not have an addiction or somebody who has been restrained and has never been able to indulge and suddenly they do and they go off the deep end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember, um, when I first went to college, like even through high school, my parents had like a set curfew bed for time for me. Not like a um, nine o'clock your bedtime, but I had to be home. If it wasn't the weekend, I had to be home by 11 in bed. Uh, I could read all night if I wanted to, but I had to be in bed or I could play my Game Boy or something. But the moment I got to college... Like my first trimester or my first semester yeah, of school. Trimester. <laughs> yeah. Well, I teach at a school that does trimesters, that's why it's in my head. But um my first semester at school, like I, my grades didn't really suffer too bad because I got a lot of general BS classes because they make you take those. But I wasn't the A student, A B student I was. I was a B C student. 
And that was because, oh, I could stay up as late as I want. So I'd go down like, oh, it's midnight. Oh, man, nothing's. Wait, there's a ton of stuff open near campus. And I'll walk down and get a sandwich, go like hang out with people in like the mall or something, like in the middle of the night, go play frisbee at dark with a glow and a dark frisbee or whatever, just hanging out with people in the middle of the night because I don't have to go to bed. So I had that overindulging moment. And I can see that happening with a lot of people with different things. Yeah. Video games, food, whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that, man. Um, I think at the end of the day, when you kind of think about it, it's, you know, it's, especially if you have kids and they're into games and such, it's more on the moderation aspect, right? Keep them busy. Don't always have them on a game system. Allow that delayed um, sense of gratification, like Joel was saying, because, you know, it's that's a good way to ensure that they're not just getting their gratification out of video games. They're getting gratification out of other aspects of life. And then there is can... that reward component afterwards of being able to play that game. Well, also, I think it's also what games are you allowing them to play? That too. I mean, there's certain games where, you know, you develop hand-eye coordination, you develop puzzle-solving skills. I think that's why D&D is such a versatile game, and it's one of those things where... There's so many aspects to it that it's one of those things. If you get into D&D, it can seem like D&D is consuming everything because you're focused on different aspects of it at any given point. For instance, as someone who DMs, I play once a week as well. I'd like to be a player. I like to play the game. I don't want to have to think about building stuff for players. I'd like to just be able to sit in and enjoy it. So I have three games I play. Um... I play two as a player, one as a DM, and but then there's also different aspects to it. There's the art aspect of doing minis. Yeah. There's the story creation aspect of the DMing and balancing and doing number crunching and things like that, trying to balance out encounters to as to threaten to wipe the party. But if they're smart and they get decent rolls, they won't. Although the challenge should be that if they roll dog shit, they're going to die. So... Um, always having that balance in certain aspects. Um, but like kids, so there's been some studies being done. Um, and one of the things I want to try, I've also tried to do this in my classroom at school really is introduce these aspects of D and D into stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, having kids that teamwork, the problem solving, the, um, collaboration, between uh, people. I mean, those are all skills you pick up through D&D &D and in some regards, multiplayer games. Yeah, totally with you on that. And I would say that, it, you know, I do agree with your point. It depends on the type of game that they're playing. Me personally, I grew up playing a lot of RPGs. I grew up playing a lot of action adventure games, things that you kind of had to take a pause that you weren't consistently playing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Story building elements that, you know, in a way have kind of shaped me to be the person I am today with a lot of those titles. You know, if you kind of look back at Final Fantasy games that I played, um, it developed a storytelling component. It, you know, forced me in a sense of, oh, I got to level up. All right. I don't want to level up right now. I'm going to pause and just I'll take this back up tomorrow. Is that way whenever you're like really struggling to do something around the house, you get spiky hair? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's why I get spiky hair. But you, know, you get know, protagonist hair, and you, suddenly you now you can solve the problem. <laughs> exactly, that's all it is. Uh, but you know, and then you look at things like first-person shooters that you can consistently play over and over and over again, especially multiplayer online games. And I can see where addictions can kind of set in from those types of games versus you know games like when you and I were growing up. It's well, shit, that Mario level's way too hard. I'm going to try it again tomorrow. And well, I think there's also that of aspect of you didn't have saves. Yeah, that's true. When we were too. growing up, like you. Well, we had codes though. I didn't. <laughs> okay, some some games have codes, some didn't. Um, but yeah, I think overall it's an interesting topic, and uh, you know maybe we'll talk more about this in future. I might get Ryan's take on it as well. But uh, you know we're running on some time right here. We got some D and D. We're going to be kicking back on here in the next. 15, 20 minutes with Justin, so got to give him a buzz. Uh, but, dude, thanks for uh, filling in this week. And, uh, no problem. And D&D and game addictions. Um, of course, catch this episode on all of those awesome podcast applications like the one you're listening to now. You can put your dick away now. I, I will put it away now. Uh, so if you don't like the podcast app that you're listening to, we're, of course, on Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Stop Overcast. Stop all of us, <laughs> all of those podcast apps. Uh, find us on social media at the Game Deflators on Facebook and Instagram at Game Deflators on Twitter. Do not say OnlyFans. And uh, 
It's not on OnlyFans. Uh, we don't have the OnlyFans? No, it's Pornhub uh, Premium. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Find us on our Pornhub Premium uh, at Game Deflators. Uh, and then you can, of course, find us on thegamedeflators.com. Uh, so this has been episode 138 of the Game Deflators podcast. My name's John. I've been joined by Joel, our DM. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye.